Art is a reflection of the society in which it comes from, and as such, it will ask its audience questions to consider. For example, at a glance, Finding Nemo examines the dangers of overparenting your kid and turning them into a rebellious, spiteful asshole, and also letting go as a parent or something. I don't know, that's not as interesting to me. Take any other piece of art as your choice, and I'm sure you would find that it asks its own set of questions. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been engaging with a piece of media, and you see it possesses many of the same themes as earlier works you've engaged with? But when you start to examine this piece, and the one with similar ideas, you realize that this new piece was created almost as an exact thematic inverse of the previous one. In other words, they ask the same questions, but they give opposite answers. Gurren Lagann is a show which really interests me, not in isolation, mind you, but how it functions as a meta response to another anime from 13 years earlier that many of these same people also helped create. Alright, let's take a step back for a second. In 1995, Gainax releases the mecha anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, a passion project of the then-experienced animator Hideki Anno. In this project, Anno sought to explore his own depression and psychological issues. The result of doing this was a TV anime which stood in pretty stark contrast to its predecessors. Whereas before the pilots and mecha shows had been noble, brave, and willing to protect their people, the main character Shinji lives in abject terror of the duty placed upon him. While I don't doubt that Shinji is written this way because it is reflective of Anno's own feelings, it should also be noted that Anno is someone who has continually called for the anime industry to innovate and avoid stagnation. Creating a protagonist in this vein was yet another way to stand out from the crowd. After the release of Evangelion, the state of anime was changed forever. There are many videos which exist on the subject, but I think one of the most interesting and illuminating comparisons I have heard drawn is that what Star Wars is to America, Evangelion is to Japan. Ubiquitous, culturally important, and revolutionary. Just as Star Wars spawned the blockbuster, Evangelion spawned the original TV anime. And just as you can eventually trace the success of almost any blockbuster to Star Wars, the same holds true for original anime after Evangelion. Unsurprisingly then, many shows which followed Ava decided to borrow from its tone and themes. I'm sure both for financial capitalization and creative inspiration. But now let's go back again to 1995, when the director of Gurren Lagann is handed his first job in the industry. Hiroyuki Amiishi first got his start working as a key animator on Evangelion. From there, he worked with Gainax over the years on many other projects, until finally getting his first directing role on Tenga Tapa Gurren Lagann. Now while Evangelion is undoubtedly the brainchild of Hideki Anno, such a direct connection cannot be made for Gurren Lagann. Hiroyuki notes that Gurren Lagann was a project which already existed before he was appointed director. When it came to pre-production, much of the project was already planned out before he was put in charge. But he does note that he did have some discretion, and obviously injected his own ideas and influence. When asked about the unbridled optimism present in Gurren Lagann, Hiroyuki ties his answer directly into Neon Genesis Evangelion. He acknowledges that, after Neon Genesis Evangelion, there is a time when the protagonist would refuse to pilot Mecha. It was almost an antithesis to what mecha anime had been during the 70s and 80s, that you piloted mecha willingly and fought hard. However, with Neon Genesis Evangelion, refusing to pilot mecha embodied the youth of that era. 
These things are cyclical, though. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. As when I was working on Gurren Lagann, there was too much of this refusal-type attitude. From my standpoint, if someone asked me to pilot a mecha, I would even if they said I wasn't allowed to. As far as I have dug, this is one of the only direct refutations Hiroyuki acknowledges to be present in Gurren Lagann. There are other interviews which acknowledge the obvious impact of Evangelion on the show, but few others which say, because Ava did this, we did the opposite. Still, from that, we can garner that there was at least somewhat of a concerted effort to refute the tropes and attitudes the studio itself had caused to permeate the industry. Which is why I think now is the appropriate time to ask a big and important question. One that will help lay the groundwork for the rest of this analysis. What is the message of Evangelion? And what is the message of Gurren Lagann? Evangelion is a show about loneliness, depression, how we relate to other people, and the ultimate futility in all of it. Despite everyone's best efforts, the main characters grow increasingly estranged from one another as the story progresses, to the point where Shinji, Misato, Rei, and Asuka will no longer speak to one another by the final episodes. The payoff of this unrelation comes in the end of Evangelion, where it appears the vast majority of humanity chooses to forego its individuality, combine into a giant space creature, and give up on the idea of being a human because it's too difficult. Gurren Lagann is a show which aims to demonstrate precisely the opposite. Gurren Lagann is a show about how human progression can ultimately backfire and bring about harm to ourselves. Yet despite this fact, Humanity continually decides to deal with that hardship and play with that fire, asserting that being a human being is awesome. Fighting is awesome. When the world is in a state of peace, we see the characters overcome with tedium. Only when all these disjointed, vibrant, and clashing personalities work together to overcome a great obstacle do they appear to be enjoying themselves. From here, we can see the fundamental difference which helps to understand how these shows are related. While the characters in Evangelion struggle to live, the characters in Gurren Lagann live to struggle. Evangelion detests our constant fighting, while Gurren Lagann embraces it. And that simple distinction helps illuminate why these two plots stand as inversions of each other. Evangelion thrives in a state of breakdown. Everything is always broken. The Avas are always breaking. The characters are mentally breaking. The city, the world, and eventually the entire human race break down. Evangelion asserts that our differences will drive us apart, piece by piece, person by person, city by city, until the whole world ceases to exist. Gurren Lagann starts in a fractured world and builds it into a better society. The key to this progression is combining. Once Communist steals a gunman, he insists that Simone and him combine in order to increase their attack power. Simone continues to combine throughout the series, with robots that grow increasingly larger every time. When Simone combines with someone, the two people do not merge their consciousness into one, but rather coordinate their separate, distinct movements in order to defeat their enemies. These two approaches are also reflected in the plot structure. The people of Tokyo 3 wait for threats to approach them, and rarely do the characters in Evangelion stray from outside the city. They're helpless, with little agency, doing the best they can to fend off foreign threats. But this is ultimately an ineffectual effort. It's saying, even if you stand still and live conservatively, everything will still break around you. Gurren Lagann rarely stays in one place. The story is a constant journey, trekking across the Earth's surface and eventually the entire galaxy. Humanity could choose to ignore the threats and live underground, but they deliberately meet and challenge whatever stands in the way of human progress. It instead says, in order to continue, humanity must charge forward. Up to this point, I have focused on direct inversions things in Gurren Lagann that seem to directly spit in the face of Evangelion. But not everything that happens in Gurren is so directly defiant. In fact, 
There are many characters, events, and underlying ideas which are similar, but one delineation that helps explain how these similarities ultimately look for in side by side is the tone. I want to look at one theme which recurs in both shows time and time again. Sexuality. It's the sex! When asked what sex is, Evangelion shows it at its most awkward, uncomfortable, confusing, frustrating, and unhealthy states. Shinji's affection for the women in his life is totally repressed. He constantly denies his urges whenever they're brought to attention by another character. And I don't have to mention this scene, do I? But even beyond our main character, there's still plenty of weird sex to go around. Most solo scenes of Asuka show that she is also confused about her own feelings for Kaji and Shinji. But really, the character who exemplifies this the most is, of course, Misato. Despite having pretty bitter feelings towards Kaji and realizing he makes a bad partner, Misato ultimately reforms a sexual relationship with him. When we first see her go to sleep with him, it's after months of grueling, depressing hard work. This is the relief in her life. She doesn't do it because she loves Kaji, or at least this isn't her primary reason at first. She does it because she needs to. Because she can't make it through her job without it. It's portrayed to be as unhealthy as it sounds. However, I am willing to acknowledge that this interpretation of Misato might be doing her character a little bit of disservice. I think Misato's sexuality does go a lot deeper because ultimately, it seems to be her character's primary mode of expression. That said, it still comes across as a little unhealthy. Now before we move on, I want to ask you guys a question. What does the first kiss look like in Evangelion? Yikes. It's awkward, borderline harassment, tense, and honestly does nothing to put me in the mood. If anything, it makes me wildly uncomfortable. Now when we look at Kamina and Yoko's scene... Wow. Much better. You get your man, Yoko. Now most of you probably think Gurren Lagann doesn't even really address sex. I mean, it's not in this series explicitly at any point. But just because there is no sex, doesn't mean there is no sexuality. I'd argue, if anything, Gurren Lagann fully embraces sex far more than its spiritual predecessor. There's a reason Yoko dresses like a stripper. You know, b besides getting horny teens to watch this show. And there's a reason Kamina and Simone also walk around half-naked. It's because here, they are expressing sexuality rather than repressing sexuality. It isn't weird or shameful for them to walk around shirtless. It's awesome. In some ways, it's a middle finger to Evangelion for acting like this stuff is something to be shameful of. And speaking of middle finger, watch how these two shows handle the rules of their universe and exposition. <laughs> オゾンを紛失しているところは汚染されていません。同時駆動変更。シンクロポーズを15秒単位にして。月軌道上にある地球ら専属の機関、カテドラルテラ。その力を引き出すのは全てら戦力。進化しようとする力のこと。優勢生
Simone and Shinji are both younger teenagers, on the cusp to come of age. We witness both of them get sucked into a conflict they didn't ask for, live in the shadow of the competent people around them, and continually struggle with self-confidence and doubt. They both start as the type of characters where, if they felt they could be doing anything else, they probably would be. The only thing which continually compels them to return to fighting is the people around them. Yet despite similar starts, Simone and Shinji end as completely different characters. And the difference can be understood most well in the difference between Kamina and Misato. At early points in both series, the protagonists try to run away from their duty. In Evangelion, when Shinji tries to leave, he is met with scorn, shame, and an angered indifference. Misato says, I don't give a shit. Do what you want. Doom this city if you goddamn please. And Shinji almost goes through with this, on several occasions. Much like how a child can grow up with low confidence due to the way a parent raises them, Shinji is not encouraged with love to take up his duties. He is only punished with exile if he chooses to abandon his cause. Simone also has a similar moment early on, but rather than shame him for being scared, Kamina aims to inspire him. He says to Simone, You aren't running away from this because I need you. I won't let you do that. And you can bet that I will also play support to you. The relationship here is clearly much less distant. As an interesting thought experiment, I want you to imagine Kamina is placed in the Evangelion, and he meets the main characters. As they act cold and distant, Kamina would respond with confusion. He would call them out for their depressing behavior, and tell them to lighten up. As Shinji would stand scared in front of the Eva for the first time, Kamina would laugh and just push him into it. A character like him could likely snap everyone into a new mode of thinking, and restore morale through his motivational speeches. To put it simply, Kamina is the ultimate manly hype man. But of course, I've danced around something large in the previous paragraph. The real reason Simone undergoes a dramatic character change, and the elephant in the room for anyone who has watched Gurren Lagann, is that Kamina dies. Following Kamina's death, we witness Simone break down and enter a very similar state of depression to Shinji in the early episodes of Evangelion. And understandably so, his best friend got murdered in front of him due to his own ineptitude. While this almost pushes Simone to abandon fighting, he ultimately realizes that since Kamina is gone, someone has to step up and lead Team Lagan. He knows he can never be Kamina, but he doesn't have to. He is Simone. And by that point, Simone is good enough to lead the group. In other words, he has accepted his role, gained his confidence, and come to terms with his place in the world. Shinji never gets such an arc. Now while Misato does ultimately die at the end of Evangelion, Shinji doesn't directly witness it. And not enough time passes after this incident to understand how this might have impacted his character. Had Misato died in episode 12 or so, would Shinji have been more inspired to fight? Or would he have run away? Ultimately, this is speculation, but I lean towards saying he probably would have run away because Misato never inspired Shinji. She chastised him. She berated him. She expressed extreme disapproval. But she never gave him a sufficient personal reason to fight. The difference in how Simone and Shinji develop from relatively the same place is not an internal difference in reaction, but an external difference in their interpersonal relationships with those close to them. If you put Kamina in Misato's place, and Misato in Kamina's place, it's likely Shinji would end up being more confident and competent, while Simone would ultimately retreat into cowardice. While we're on character analogs, let's discuss two more characters with parallel roles. Yoko and Asuka is an interesting one, because while I'd say they largely fall into the same archetype, they pretty much exist at opposite spectrums of the term Sundere. Yes, Asuka is very cold to Shinji, and Yoko is very combative to Kamina. But right off the bat, it's very obvious that Yoko has feelings for Kamina, 
and while they bicker or occasionally annoy one another, you never get the sense they actually dislike each other. Yoko is annoyed by Kamina, but she likes to be annoyed by Kamina. Compare this to Asuka, and my god is there a stark difference. Asuka can be fucking brutal to Shinji, calling him weak, incompetent, a loser. On my planet, I am kind of a loser, like you. There really is just this sense of jealousy and vitriol that forms their toxic bond. Whereas Yoko may not express her feelings well, but ultimately accepts them, Asuka's envy takes over her entire personality. She won't let herself say how she feels to Shinji because she refuses to acknowledge that weakness in her character, that she can't attain perfection on her own, and that someone might be better at her job than she is. This toxic, horrible, an unhealthy expression of her emotions is part of the reason Shinji ultimately tries to choke her at the end of Evangelion, in a horrifying and striking final shot, I might add. Can you imagine any of Yoko's allies in the series coming to choke her out? I can't imagine that happening for three seconds, and I think that fundamentally speaks about how different Yoko and Asuka are, despite technically occupying the same trope. Oh, and before you guys misinterpret this or take me out of context, Finally, let's get to the two characters who serve a similar thematic and story role, Rei and Nia. Two characters who have trouble expressing their emotions that appear human, but in reality are not. Two characters who are portrayed giant and naked against the backdrop of space at the end of the story. And two characters who are literally the key to the series' climax and finale. So what defines the differences between Rei and Nia? Well, in some ways it's everything. Nia is someone who talks endlessly but whose words are confusing while Rei is someone who is quiet and precise in her language, but rarely lets anyone peek into her mind. Both these characters are constantly misunderstood by those around them, but where Rei reacts with indifference, Nia will prattle on with jargon until the person she is speaking to understands what she is trying to say. This again reflects the tonal difference between the shows. Shinji's relationship with Rei is stilted and awkward, but admittedly has its heartfelt moments, whereas Simone and Nia's relationship is pretty much just made as cute and lovable as possible. Just look at them. Adorable. I'll admit I didn't see this connection at first. It wasn't until Nia was displayed against the moon in some weird alien form that it clicked for me how these characters were thematically similar. Look, I, I, I know I'm dumb, okay? This, this is the most obvious thing if you think about it for more than three seconds. I just wasn't seeing it. I was too busy taking notes on literal events to see the full picture. I'm so sorry. And speaking of the moon, I don't need to explain this connection, do I? In Evangelion, we fly to the moon. In Gurren Lagann, the moon flies into us. Now, with many of the differences I have mentioned thus far, one factor to account for these which should not be neglected is the difference in genre. Evangelion is a science fiction show, and Gurren Lagann is an adventure fantasy. It's the reason one show looks bleak and desaturated, while the other is one of the most beautiful pieces of animation ever conceived. That's not to say Ava doesn't look great. It looks incredible at its own gritty style, but Gurren Lagann aims to be sexy and colorful, and it hits the nail on the head in that regard. This is also largely the same reason aforementioned exposition is treated as a waste of time in one show, an important gospel in the other. And since I've already said the word gospel, let's talk about religion. Yeah, that's always a fun sentence to hear. Neon Genesis Evangelion translates roughly to New Century Gospel, with gospel meaning good news, and also, of course, a reference to Jesus Christ, the savior in the Christian religion. Despite its title, Evangelion doesn't directly address religion anywhere in the show, at least in an explicit manner, but the themes and logics of religion permeate the characters and events that unfold. 
Every impact in Evangelion is described as a mythical event. The characters seem to have an understanding of it that parallels the way religion describes the end times. Characters fear of another impact in much the same way Christians fear, or Deloitte, depending on who you are, the prophecies contained in the Book of Revelations. Now, if what I just said is a stretch to some of you, and you don't entirely agree, I don't blame you. I'll admit this isn't the strongest argument I've put forth here, but where you can't refute the similarities is in the ending. Neon Genesis Evangelion ends with the Instrumentality Project, a project which aims to break down all differences between human beings and coalesce into perfect harmony with each other and the world. Now Shinji ultimately rejects this, but we'll get to that in a second. I can't speak much for the paradise described in other religions, but the idea of perfect harmony is something which comes up a lot in Christianity. Heaven is described as being a place absent of human emotions and differences, where everyone lives in eternity and happiness. Catholic Christianity purports that our goal is to make a heaven of earth, to take the steps necessary to secure harmony and peace here, to make this world as great as possible. In that way, the instrumentality project is undeniably inspired from Catholic Christian ideals. Now I'm sure a priest or religious scholar will poke holes in this as Catholicism asks people to willingly choose God, and they'll see this method as cheating or somehow against the rules. But whether it actually conforms to religious doctrine is not really the point. The point is that given a reading of the Bible, it's understandable how someone could conclude this would be a perfect enactment of those ideals. In other words, the character's religion and belief that humanity is an inferior species, wrought with some kind of sin or flaw, leads them to this conclusion. Gurren Lagann addresses religion in a much more direct manner. Right from the moment Kamina meets the underground priests, he seeks to dismantle their beliefs. He gets depressed when he sees the priest has unknowingly manipulated an entire town into fear of the outside. He wants them to be free, to face the fears head on and believe in themselves rather than a higher power. And this is a theme which is constantly reiterated. The value of humanity is declared time and time again, and it's made most obvious in the finale when the human race has to go up against the anti-spirals. After rejecting the Spiral King in his traditional way of doing things, humanity is punished with attempted damnation and extinction by the anti-spirals, creatures who might as well be gods. But rather than bow down to these godlike creatures and accept their fate, humanity decides they must battle them to secure the future of their species. Even if they are technically inferior, even if their actions push the universe into a more dangerous place, the human race ultimately decides that it cannot be shackled to any gods, and must decide for itself what their duty is. One moment which really epitomizes the difference in these philosophies comes at the tail end of both series. When Shinji enters the instrumentality project, he rejects it. He decides that living in perfect harmony, no matter how much better it may seem, is ultimately a farce. Anyone who partakes in the instrumentality project is forfeiting their humanity. Therefore, Shinji acknowledges and accepts that the human race must always be less than the universe. And Gurren Lagann ends with them combining into a robot bigger than the size of the entire universe, asserting that if we push ourselves to our limits and work with one another, we can literally accomplish the impossible. But this power is only possible because the characters in the Lagann refuse to accept the rules of reality for what they are, and refuse to be bound by some notion of a higher power. The natural outcomes of this is reflected in the state of the species, planet, and universe at the end of both shows. At the end of Evangelion, most of humanity has left the Earth. The planet has transformed into a wasteland. Humanity lives in perfect harmony, but by that point they really aren't human anymore, and they never can grow and learn beyond that final point of the instrumentality project. At the end of Lagan, there is no implied perfect harmony or utopian world, but rather Humanity accepts the world isn't perfect, that their power may lead to their demise if they aren't careful. Yet, despite the risks involved, they accept the challenges are worth it anyway. 
and set out on a new mission to meet alien life forms. It scoffs at Ava. You can't even settle your own differences? We're going to make friends across the galaxy. Because... why not? The whole time, this question has seemed to be the key difference. Ava asks why, and Gurren asks why not? Or why are you choosing to see it that way? Why is sexuality awkward? Well, why does it have to be? Why is everything a constant battle? Why do you want things to be easy? Why are we all so different? Why can't we understand each other? Why would you want us to be the same? Isn't our differences and individuality, when combined, what makes us so great? Why can't humanity move in a constant state of harmony? Why wouldn't you want humanity to continually evolve into something better? I can't stress enough how I think of these shows as companion pieces. Two halves of a whole that seek to answer the same questions with different answers. So really, what does that mean? Well, I think it represents a choice. Not for the characters who constantly embody these ideals and personality traits, but for us, the viewers. The only ones who can experience both these worlds. Watching Neon Genesis Evangelion and Tenga Tapa Gurren Lagann back to back is an exercise in perspective. It is an implicit reminder that there are two sides to every story, and that neither one of them may necessarily be right or wrong, only that they both exist. In reality, there are many, many, many sides to every story, and this just happens to be a case of two diametrically opposed shows displaying similar conundrums with the key difference between both series not being the conflict itself, but how the characters choose to handle it. And now here comes the peanut gallery's extrapolated advice. Ready? Three, two, one. There are always going to be factors you can't control for and things that make life more difficult. But perhaps in adjusting your perspective, you can better manage those brutal blows you might be dealt. Feel sadness when it is appropriate and fight to claw your way out of depression when it is not. In essence, if you want to end up like Simone more often than you end up like Shinji, control for what is controllable. Embrace the good times as much as you can. Find hobbies and interests that make your life rewarding. And if something suddenly becomes very hard, keep trying at it for a while. It may just be a small bump in the road. Finally, and this is most important, if you find yourself being beckoned back by your estranged father on your 14th birthday, PILOT THE DAMN ROBOT! Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Let's abuse that sweet, juicy algorithm. I'm going to leave some other random similarities and differences in the notes section of the description. There was a lot of stuff that I either felt like didn't need more than a sentence to explain, or just somehow didn't fit into this video. Uh, second piece of housekeeping. So I have a feeling there might be two very specific disagreements people have with this video. One pertaining to why the Ava Rebuild movies were not mentioned, and another which sees this as cherry picking because I ignored all the other Gainax shows between Evangelion and Gurren Lagann. And uh, I, I had tangents about this like originally elsewhere in the script, but I just really thought it didn't fit. So I decided to put them in a separate video where I just kind of talk over a still picture for anyone curious how I might answer either of those two questions. They're really just random asides, and if they don't bother you, then there's no reason to watch that video. It's unlisted anyway. I'm not trying to get a lot of people to watch it. I want people to watch it who saw this video first. That's, that's why it's separate. That's why it's the way it is. Finally, what do you guys think? Was I totally off base? Did I take my analysis too far? What did I miss? What did I hit the nail on the head for? Who do you think is the hottest adult character across both series? Let me know in the comments below.